Video games are sweeping the world, and the revolution is just beginning. So whether you have a computer at home or just invest a quarter while you're waiting for a pizza, we're going to be here to keep you right up to date. The esports industry has ballooned over the last couple of years. Legends are born, heroes are made, and legacies are forged. But where did it all start? How did esports actually begin? What's going on, Pro Guides fam? I'm Kangas, and let's face it, the Pro Guides brand is one that's only able to exist due to the competitive nature of video games. Without that, tips and tricks wouldn't have much of a point. Esports in 2020 is a massive industry with competitions spanning the whole planet, but the origins of esports are actually far more humble. To uncover the origins of esports, we have to go way further back than you would initially expect. All the way back to one of the very first video games that were ever created, Space War. Developed in 1962 by Steve Russell for the DEC PDP-1 mini-computer at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Space War was a simple game. Two spaceships, one dubbed the Needle and the other dubbed the Wedge, would fight one another while also navigating the gravity well of a star. Both ships would be controlled by a human player who would have to manage a combination of their limited fuel, ammunition, and the effects of the star's gravity on the spacecraft as well as the utilization of a hyperspace jump for quick escapes. Space War was never released commercially, though it did go on to inspire a whole bunch of early video games, and was also shared amongst the program community of the 1960s. Because of that, over the years, multiple different versions of Space War were created, including a version that would later be used for one of the very first video game tournaments. The year was 1972, exactly 10 years after the initial release of Space War. Video games were completely unknown to most people and the first Pong machines wouldn't be installed until six weeks after the first Space War tournament. An editor for the Rolling Stone magazine, Stuart Brand, was doing a story on computers and their potential to change the world. And everywhere he went, people were playing Space War. It gave Stuart an idea. If so many people were already having fun playing Space War together, then what better to do than create a massive tournament for the game, where some of the best Space War players could come together and try to find out who was truly the ultimate space pilot. But what would be on the line for such an epic competition? Well, how does a year-long subscription to the Rolling Stones magazine sound? It was almost a joke that he put himself on the um, um, Rolling Stone article as a sports editor. So Stuart Brand, sports editor for the Rolling Stone. And just like that, the Intergalactic Space War Championships was born. It's interesting to note that the build of the game that they were using was different to the original in many ways. In this version of the game, it would be a free-for-all of five players involved, and a team game of duos, all playing off of one single console. Hyperspace would be disabled to get rid of any and all RNG, and the sun would be on killer mode, meaning if you fell into its gravity well completely, that's game over. Around two dozen players gathered with more people watching in the wings. The duo's tournament was won by Slim Tovar and Robert E. Moss, while the free-for-all winner was Bruce Baumgart. So I was just, just a student there playing the game. The games were fast-paced and intricate, a deadly dance of space mines, spaceships, and gravity assists as they flung themselves by the sun. It was spectacular, and the crowd loved it, but it was fleeting. You win Space War, you consider the whatever, you yep. move and, on. And, and then 50 years later, it becomes a big deal. I was at a class and they just could not believe that esports was such a little thing to us. This was esports before video games had even really been invented yet. It was a closed off event of the first computer nerds, the most underground of underground tournaments you could possibly imagine to have ever taken place. A real computer game tournament wouldn't happen for another eight years. This is Andy Leonard at the 1980 Atari Games. Lots of excitement here. Stiff competition in basketball. And for the first time, Space Invaders. Fast forward to 1980, the world of video games is a very different place. Arcades had sprung up all over the country, and by 1981, the video game industry in the US alone would already be generating upwards of $5 billion on an annual basis. The community had grown, it had evolved, and the urge for competition was brewing. Space Wars was the omen of things to come. Space Invaders was where things really started to get interesting. What is considered by many to be the very first major esports tournament took place in America in 1980. It was dubbed the National Space Invaders Championship and had been organized by the well-known console and games production company, Atari. 
The tournament began with a series of regional qualifiers in multiple different cities across the states. According to newspapers at the time, the qualifier stage of the tournament attracted around 10,000 competitors from around the country to try and show off their Space Invader skills. There would be five regional winners from each qualifying event, and the winners of those would win $150 and an all-expenses-paid plane trip to the location of the finals if they needed one. Then, the grand finals itself, hosted at the New York Super Bowl. The winner of the final tournament, which would be decided by whoever had the highest score before being eliminated by the AI aliens, would receive a table copy of Missile Command for $2,000 while the second place runner-up received a home computer with a modest $1,000, and finally, third place runner-up received a $500 check. The winner of the tournament ended up being Rebecca Heinemann, who would later go on to become a video game designer and programmer in her own right, solidifying herself as a rock star in the history of esports. You know how to program the Atari? <laughs> I know somebody you could talk to, and he got me in touch with the, guy, the people who owned the Avalon Hill Game Company. They hired me on the spot, and that's when I started programming Atari 2600 oh. cartridges. While this tournament was much more expansive than the Space Wars tournament, featuring members of the public and even qualifying rounds that thousands of people entered, it was also missing something. For an eSport to really be an eSport, there has to be a level of player versus player competition. And the Space Invaders tournament really had none of that. Do you think the popularity of Space Invaders has peaked? No, I think it's still on the upward trend. Um, but there's lots of new games coming out to succeed Space Invaders. To find the true beginning of esports, the genuine early start to the thriving industry that we now know, we have to skip forward another decade to the 1990s. The genesis of the internet did wonders for the world of esports. For the first time, people over vast distances could play with one another, something that had never really been possible before. One of the main ways that people would play games on this early version of the internet was through Duango the dial-up wide area network games operation, which ran multiplayer servers for Doom, Doom 2, and Heretic. This network is what allowed Deathmatch 95 to occur. Deathmatch 95 was an online deathmatch tournament held between September 18th, 1995 and October 30th, 1995. Qualification matches were played in the States on various Duango regional servers on the Ultimate Doom, Doom 2, and Heretic. Meanwhile, separate qualifying events were also occurring in the United Kingdom and France which allowed two European players to get through to the finals. The only requirements for players to be able to enter these tournaments was an active Duango registration, which included people that signed up specifically for the tournament. Each registered player also had to own the Ultimate Doom, Doom 2, and Heretic games to be able to take place. Each tournament match adhered to basically the same format. There would be a five minute round in each of the three games, and the winner of the match would be determined by combining the frag count between all three games. Level select was at random, but if both players agreed on it, another level could be selected instead. The semifinals and grand finals of the event, however, would not take place online. For the 22 players that managed to get through the grueling qualifiers, they would have to go to the Microsoft Judgment Day event in Redmond, Washington. 50,000 entrants have been whittled down to 24 finalists who've gathered here at the Windows 95 launch to decide who will quite literally win the competition. This event was massive. The biggest esports event that we had ever seen, because it was held at a party that Microsoft was hosting to showcase Windows 95 and the launch of Microsoft Game Studios. Windows 95 is the game platform. In other words, the event was a pretty big deal, especially in the history of gaming. There was a Ferris wheel, a fully sized circus tent with food, and a three-story light-up volcano. Hell, Jay Leno was hosting the main stage event, and Bill Gates was shouting about DirectX being the next big gaming platform. And amongst all of this, there was another stage, specifically dedicated to the upcoming tournament. Matches in the semifinals would be a little different than the ones that had happened in the qualifying matches. Instead of happening in all three games, the semifinals matches would only take place in Doom 2. Each round would be a single elimination, 10 minute deathmatch, so if the player was eliminated, they'd be gone for good. The finals were even more different and wouldn't be taking place on any of the three previous games. This was a major event and Microsoft had some of the best players around at their fingertips, players that they didn't want to waste. So they let the players practice on a brand new game called Hexen before making that the official game that the finals would be played on. The two finalists were Stoney and the legendary Dennis Thresh Fong. A meta had already been developing in Hexen during the practice rounds, players liked to use the Cleric class as it was the easiest to learn and had a homing type weapon that seemed to be more powerful than just about anything else that was in the game. So Thresh did something completely unexpected. 
He found a counter in the Mage class and used that to utterly decimate Stony 8-0. It was the biggest LAN event of the era, and Thresh had thrashed his opponent to walk away with a one-year-long VIP membership to his chosen Duango server, a lifetime supply of games by id Software, and finally, a state-of-the-art Pentium multimedia gaming PC that had reportedly been valued at around $10,000. That Microsoft tournament, which was in 1995, was the, pretty much the first eSport tournament ever with spectators and people cheering. It was, it was pretty wild. The success of the Deathmatch 95 tournament can't be understated, but it wasn't the tournament that truly propelled eSports into existence as we understand it today. It was a solid first step, though. The first real big tournament came two years later, Red Annihilation in 1997. This tournament was not based on Doom like the ones that had come before it. It was based on the new top competitive game of the time, Quake. And I remember the day it came out, I and, and a group of my friends were poised in front of our computers waiting for the release so we could download it from the net. And uh, you know, when we finally got it, um, let, let's just say our girlfriends didn't see us for, for quite some time. They're Quake Widows. Held in May of 1997, it was one of the biggest nationwide video game competitions so far, this time taking part at that year's E3 conference. The prize pool was a hefty $5,000, which would be the equivalent to around $8,000 today. But the guys at id Software weren't willing to let things stand at that. And so the lead developer of Quake, John Carmack, historically decided to throw his Ferrari in as the grand prize of the event. The winner? A familiar face. It was Thresh once again. Easily the most memorable moment of my career. The irony, of course, is I think I was like 17 at the time. John Carmack is like, dude, how are you getting this car home? It's like, I like <laughs> Following the growing success of these major events, a few weeks later, the very first gaming league was formed. They were the Cyber Athlete Professional League, and they began to hold tournaments semi-regularly. Dave, the CPL, well, what is this exactly? Angel Munoz started this company, or the, this group in 1997 to make computer sports just like legitimate sports. Now, okay. legitimate sports, what is that anymore? Is that, do you have to have fans? Does it need to be Olympic caliber? You know, obviously football is a sport, but is golf a sport? and they were joined shortly after by the AMD Professional Gamers League. Both groups ran Quake tournaments to begin with, but quickly expanded their gaming rosters to include other games such as the quickly up-and-coming StarCraft. By the turn of the millennium, esports and online gaming were gaining notoriety at a rapid pace. And while it would take another decade for any of it to be taken truly serious by mainstream media, these early events were the things that kicked everything else into high gear. It all started off in the lab of a university, with some incredibly smart coders huddled around a mini supercomputer that could only play a basic player versus player game. Competition heated up when the games went mainstream, with high score attack tournaments becoming all the rage. But with the introduction of the internet and online gaming, esports really took off. And we began the journey to where we are now, over 20 years later. The players may change, the pedigree stays the same. If you join SKT, you are very likely to become a world champion. Would you like to learn more about the early years of esports? Should we tell the full story of the legendary Dennis Thresh Fong? Leave your thoughts down below, because we here at Pro Guides always love looking for your feedback. And hey, if you enjoyed the video, why not subscribe and hit that bell so you can watch all of our awesome videos in the future. Also, go check out our back catalog. They're great. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.